talk is not the same as the one that is uh, written down there. That's mainly because, as Tony pointed out to me, I had misunderstood what the Mullins effect was. <laughs> but what I am going to be talking about, regardless, is a form of hysteresis. And I'm going to be talking about um, hysteresis in filled rubber. So first of all, I should probably tell you what filled rubber is. Uh, I should also mention before I start that this is uh, very much ongoing work uh, with uh, Tony de Lievre and Frédéric Socol. And we're all based uh, at uh, Ecole des Ponts and partly funded by INRIA in Paris. Finally, I should also thank the organizers for inviting me. <laughs> I think I've got everything out of the way. Uh, okay, so what is filled rubber? Filled rubber is uh, the most common form of uh, commercially produced rubber. So basically, I mean, rubber has been manufactured for about 200 years. Um, and it really started when, quite interestingly, a guy basically stole a load of rubber seeds from South America and brought them back to Europe. And what they found was this rubber was this very weird, very stretchy material. But uh, it took a while before someone realized that you could actually make it reasonably viable as an elastic material by adding sulfur. And so that process is called vulcanization and was uh, discovered by Goodyear, who was, who was a tire manufacturer, um, uh, early in the 19th century. Uh, no, sorry. Um, and so what happens when you add sulfur to this material is that it's made up of long chain polymers and the sulfur binds at various points to these polymers and links them together. So what you had was a tangled mess of spaghetti, which when you stretch just all the spaghetti flops all over the place. When you add the sulfur, the, the, the bits of spaghetti stick to each other and suddenly it's got a much more rigid structure. Now, to add even more rigidity for something like a tire, uh, you need to add some larger particles of sulfur. And so that's the filler, in fact. Uh, and the reason why tires are black is because of the, this filler material. Um, and the, uh, what the original material that people found was very good for this was just soot, which is quite convenient. <laughs> uh, soot, so that's like the leftover residue when you burn stuff. Not ash, but the like when, what you collect on the inside of your chimney, which is no. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty, pretty uh, convenient because, of course, soot is a, a useless waste product most of the time, and suddenly you can mix it in with your rubber and make something much, much stronger. So this is the overall structure of something like filled rubber. You've got big particles of this uh, carbon black. Uh, and in between, you've got a complex link of uh, a network of polymers. And th these polymers are all linked to each other within that matrix, if you like. Okay. Uh, so despite this very early uh, development of uh, rubber production, people didn't really actually look too in too much detail at what actually happened. They just realized that it worked and you know, just used it. But in the 1950s and 1960s, people really did some extensive experiments. And they noticed that there's an interesting kind of hysteretic ph phenomena when you do loading and loading experiments on rubber, filled rubber especially. So you take your piece of rubber, you stretch it, you unstretch it, you stretch it, you unstretch it, etc., And you measure the stress versus the stress. And so the first thing that they noticed was when you start stre stretching, you have a, a softening phenomena. So the first few cycles, the uh, strength of the material goes down, which is actually what the Mullins effect, which is not what I'm going to be talking about. And so that, that is now explained essentially as uh, when you stretch and unstretch the first few times, you break lots of bonds in the polymers. And once those bonds are broken, they don't go back to being fixed. So you really, it's very stiff. You break some of those bonds, and then when you unload again, they stay broken. You keep doing it, and then eventually, most of the bonds that are going to break are broken. But the interesting thing is that even though you have this softening, you still actually have hysteresis even after the bonds have all been broken. So you would expect that when you go forwards, you strain, the bonds break. When you go back, of course, you're going to get a different curve because now that the bonds that have broken are not contributing to the rigidity of the material. 
But nevertheless, you still actually get some hysteretic behavior. And so that's what I say here. Rate independent hysteretic behavior, just the other thing. If you do it slower and slower, you still observe the hysteresis. So this is really some rate independent hysteresis. Uh, persists after many cycles and in the limit of zero strength. Um, and I've sa as I've said, the, the first phenomena, w the softening phenomena, so I should maybe draw a picture if uh, you're not familiar with softening. So what you typically do when you do a materials experiment is you have sigma and epsilon, so stress and strain. And what you observe in this experiment is you start loading, and then you do this, and then you unload. But the second time you do it, you see it's, soft, it's uh, weaker. So this is called softening because now it's less stiff than it was before. And so you do this a few times, and your curve slowly descends. But what you always see is this loop. So when you unload, you don't take the same part. And of course, that's just true. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you do the experiment, what happens is this curve descends, but it starts, you know, it descends only so far, and eventually it, it ends up looking the same, essentially. So if you, if you really <laughs> stretch and stretch your rubber lots and lots of times, then you see the same loop. And so what we're looking to do here is to try and understand what microscopic ingredients would explain this macroscopic behavior. Okay. So we're going to think of our filler material that I had on the first slide. And we're going to design a mesoscopic model. So I'm not going to worry about the, uh, the polymers too much, but I am going to worry about the position of the filler particles, because they're typically a lot larger than the uh, polymers that are linked. And so if I label my um, filler particles, then 1 up to n, which seems standard, um, then I could m m model the force balance on one of these particles in the following way. So obviously, there's an inertial term, which is in Newtonian mechanics. Um, there should be some kind of entropic force, some kind of dissipative force, and maybe some noise, which comes from the temperature. So this is you know, very, very generic. So I need to tell you what I mean by entropic and dissipative forces. So that's what I will do. Uh, so the entropic forces are going to be related to the fact that when I uh, move these particles apart in the medium, they are, so if I go back here, they are really connected to each other via these polymers. So some of the polymers bind to the surface of the particles. And some of them will be linked across this medium. Some of them will just end in the middle of the medium, and, but will nevertheless be linked by some of these sulfur bonds in the middle. Um, and so the entropic forces are coming from the fact that when I uh, pull on a polymer molecule, there's lots of possible states that the polymer can sit in. And I'll explain <coughs> that a little bit more on the, uh, the, the next slide. And there's also a dissipative force, which is related to the fact that I can somehow lose energy into the matrix from my uh, particles, uh, maybe by radiating it as well as heat or for some other reason. But yeah. And so, unlike many people in previous talks, I'm going to neglect my noise from the start. <laughs> um, and really uh, also neglect inertial effects. So I'm really assuming somehow that I'm looking at equilibria in, uh, of the, these entropic and dissipative forces. OK, so that's my model in, a, in a hand fashion. And now I need to explain what I mean by entropic and dissipative forces. OK. So if you look at um, polymers, you can think of them as jointed chains of little rods. I mean, this is a very, very simple way of, to look at a polymer, but you, I mean, you can do this reasonably well, and that's what chemists that do a lot of the time. And what happens is these jointed rods like to sit, based on the chemistry of these things, like to sit in various um, locally stable configurations. And if I now choose to enforce the length of my polymer based on the number of rods, then I will have a, a choice of some locally stable states or approximately stable states, because I can choose 
various bond angles that will, my polymer will fit happily in. And so if I prescribe, so say these are my locally stable bond angles in a very simple 2D polymer. If I enforce the length of this long, then there's not really, there's only one choice for, say, six, uh, this is five pieces of uh, monomer. I, I can only really do this. I have to have these very sharp bond angles. But as I increase my length, then I get more and more states. And so in some sense, entropically, I should go towards, uh, I should prefer a length which is slightly longer because I have more possible stable states. So I'm arguing from the point of view of entropy that it would prefer the states which, uh, it would prefer a length which it has many possible stable states to fit in. And so I'm going to model this as basically just saying that there is some kind of spring force for a polymer. I mean, that's the, the very simplest form you could use. I mean, you could really also talk about, and people do in uh, polymer chemistry and computational polymer chemistry, try and work out what empirical potentials they should use on the basis of uh, the underlying chemistry. But I'm going to be a mathematician and choose a spring potential. <laughs> um, so that would mean that if I, so now I look at my, um, my filler particles in my in rubber inclusion matrix, uh, filler particles in my rubber matrix, and I say, well, okay, there's, there's lots of springs <coughs> linking one particle to another, so I should just model this as some spring with some uh, some um, <coughs> equilibrium length and some stiffness. And uh, let's, let's also assume that pretty much the two uh, filler particles are linked by a spring which is kind of independent of the others. So this is a lot of assumptions, but we're trying to des uh, design a simple <coughs> model. Okay. So now what about dissipative forces? Okay, so now we're going to also think back to our picture in, on the first slide, which was there's all these uh, polymers which are linked in a complicated way. And in order for two of those filler particles to move apart or come together, the polymers all have to deform and move over each other. So why not model this as some kind of uh, friction? Uh, so in a similar way to what Giovanni talked about, I can really say that, okay, if I want to move these two guys together or apart, then all of the polymers <coughs> in between need to deform and move over each other. So there should be some kind of friction coefficient like this, which should dis describe the approximate um, cost to move at some velocity, uh, that to move at some relative velocity. So that means that, in, a, in essence, my there, there's some cost for me to move these two filler particles apart at some rate. Okay. And uh, so this term is really a, uh, a kind of viscous friction, so like the wet friction that Giovanni was talking about, and this guy is really a solid friction. So that's the one where you, if you put your guy on the table and pull, then, yep. Yes, it is uh, conservative. I mean, it kind of on purpose, but it doesn't have to be conservative. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be, uh, but, but uh, I'm really, uh, I'm trying to work on a, a simple model to start with, and hopefully then we can generalize the stuff that we're talking about. But yeah, still, yeah, it is, it is conservative, in fact. Um, okay, and so th basically the point about this guy is that it doesn't, it can take any value up to um, some limit, effectively a bit like what Giovanni had with his picture, that you have some admissible, um, admissible set where you're allowed to take any value in that set. And then when you get to the boundary, you really have to take on uh, a choice of value. So that's similar to if I, if I start pulling on my block that's sitting on the table, well, the, the force um, you know, increases up to the point where I hit some limit, and then it allows me to pull anyway, and the block uh, then accelerates. Uh, 
okay. So, uh, at this, uh, I'm not really going to talk too much about the bonds, but okay, the point is, let me draw a cartoon. I'm gonna choose a very specific model in a second. I've presented everything relatively generally, but I'm gonna present a very specific model. So the idea is, suppose I had some of these particles, then I just choose some bonds which are, say, say I choose a radius that the particles are gonna communicate with each other in. So this is my I. Then B should just be some radius of particles around it. So this guy should feel the force of some group of particles near him. And that's all the bond B means, really. So oh, okay. this guy is gonna be connected to these guys. And this guy is gonna be connected to these guys, etc. No, not that guy, but yeah. There's no lattice or anything necessarily on these lines. But we're gonna consider 1D where things can be ordered, so of course, it's a bit different. Okay, so now I focus down onto a 1D system. So in 1D, this is a, a, a little bit of a, ca a cartoon of my filler particles. So the idea is I've got particles, that's I on the line, and I've got some spring, which is my, my elastic force, and I have some, uh, you can think of these guys as being kind of like the, the rods which have to pass over each other. So that's the friction, where the friction is coming from. And so if I just choose in 1D and choose nearest neighbor, I mean, I'm really focusing down onto a very simple model, um, then this is my force arm. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to drive the system via displacement boundary conditions. So that's what I would do in this experiment. I would really fix one end, fix the other end, and move it and apply whatever force necessary to get it to a certain strain. Um, and so then I can measure the, wh what, I, what do I mean by strain in this system? Well, I mean the force that acts on the last particles that I need to apply in order to get to that strain. That's what I mean. So that's why, it, that's the stress, the boundary stress, which then is constant throughout the whole, but we'll, we'll see that. Okay, so here's a nice exciting curve. <laughs> uh, um, this is what happens if I really uh, have a homogeneous system. So I fix all of my AIs to be the same, all of my mu's to be the same, all of my nu's to be the same. So it doesn't matter that I've added friction. It, if the system is homogeneous, nothing happens. <laughs> so it's not very exciting. Okay, so now I'm gonna show, the next picture is gonna be a curve where I have um, taken mu to be zero, but nu non-zero. So this would be just this system. And now you can see, not very well, unfortunately. So the green is when I uh, run, load at a certain rate. So I'm doing a cyclic loading, and I'm loading at some rate, and I slowly lower the rate. So I'm going slower and slower as I go from green to blue to red. And what you can see is, well, the, uh, the loading starts to converge back to the not very exciting curve I had before. Um, so that means that I really am not getting hysteresis in the slow loading limit. Um, and so when I add, however, the, uh, the solid friction in, then you can see that really, as I load slower and slower, there is some kind of limit cycle behavior going on. So again, green to blue to red. And so yeah, you can see that there's some kind of curve appearing here. Um, and so, now I'm gonna go to a bit more of the theoretical part. Um, obviously, there's huge literature on hysteresis. I'm by no means the first person to look at any kind of hysteretic phenomena. And we've also had lots of uh, talks already relating to this kind of, the kind of techniques that are uh, here. So there's some very big guys who've done a lot of uh, uh, um, work on looking at race-independent hysteresis and really developed a very nice framework to understand these kind of processes. The uh, a couple of things, uh, the, probably the paper that's kind of similar to what I am looking to do, and what follows is this uh, paper by Milka and Kuskinovsky in uh, ALMA, where they study a discrete continuum problem where they have coupled bistable springs, which have varying, uh, 
have a, a varying um, uh, they, they're tilted in, in essence by some random amount so that when you really uh, uh, do cyclic loading on them some of them pop into their other um, position and uh, when they pop in depends on some kind of random parameter and so when you unload and unload you will again get some kind of um, hysteretic curve like this and so they do a very nice analysis when they send into infinity and send various parameters different places and uh, they this is a nice paper there's also some work by Jan and Nanda Kumaran Rajesh from 2001 where they study some homogenization for rate independent systems but that's really still a continuous system so there's not it's not starting from the discrete tip-top as we're about to do and there's also a paper by Vicentin in 2012 where he looks at the stability of rate independent solutions and I'm going to use some of his ideas in what follows. Um, now the important feature of this model is that it's a relative friction so the guys are not moving in a background which is fixed so that the, the filler does not feel a friction which is based on where it you know it's 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 only it's feeling friction because of the positions of its neighbors and what they're doing 